Okay, as you can see on the screen, the topic, the title for my uh, uh, talk this uh, this evening is uh, disconnect, disconnect. It's it's a disconnect between God's promise and the reality of the life that we live. Now, the the theme of of the camp meeting, I love the theme. It's contending with horses, contending with horses, and and it it has led me to to this uh, to this to this topic that that disconnect uh, that I will be talking about. Now, in 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 order for us to better understand what this verse is saying to us today, we need to consider it in its context, in in the context which Jeremiah uh, was writing and and God's answer to Jeremiah's. Uh, dilemma. So allow me to read you the first four verses before God's answer to Jeremiah so we can better understand what the context is. And uh, Jeremiah was having a, a, a chat with the Lord, if you may. He was, he, was, uh, he was reasoning with God and he says, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee. Yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore does, thy, does the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me. Thou hast seen me and tried my heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep from the slaughter and prepare them for the day of, uh, of slaughter. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them that dwell therein? The beasts are consumed and the birds because they said he shall not see our last end. Contextually, Jeremiah is having a problem. He is having an issue with the Lord. Things are, are, are just not making sense to him. God is not performing what he promised to perform. He is not doing what he said he will do. There is, there is a disconnect between God's promise, God's word, God's covenant, and the reality of life. Notice what he wrote in the chapter before it, in chapter 11. Notice what he highlighted. He says, And say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Cursed is the man that does not obey God, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. All right. Jeremiah was pretty much saying to the Lord, Lord, you promised that those who do not obey your word will be cursed. And those who obey your word, those who obey your voice will be blessed. They will dwell in a land flowing with milk and honey. Yet I look around me and I do not see what your word said happening. I do not see that. I, I see the wicked prospering. I see those who are not obeying you, who do not care about you. I see the unconverted, those who, who honor you with their lips and their hearts are far from you. I see them prospering. And here I am your prophet, your servant. You know my ways. You know that I have obeyed you. You know that I have, I have suffered much for you. I do not uh, have the blessings that these wicked people have. I do not live in, in the peace that they seem to live in. I do not enjoy the quietness of life that they seem to enjoy. So what in the world is happening to your covenant, Lord? What has happened to your promise? Why is your word returned unto you void? That is what Jeremiah was asking the Lord. That is what he, uh, 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 he was going through and what he was complaining to the Lord. Now, Jeremiah was not the only one who questioned the Lord on those matters. Uh, Job said, Wherefore do the wicked live? Become old, yea, are mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Job had the same problem. He had the same question with the Lord. David said something similar. He said, Those proud people are wicked. 
but they are rich and getting richer. Clearly then, clearly, I gain nothing by keeping my thoughts pure. What good is it to keep myself from sin? God, I suffer all day long and you punish me every morning. Right? Now, do these questions ring a bell in your life? Do they speak to you? Have you been through what these prophets have been through? And have you asked God those questions? Have you asked those questions of God before? Uh, I have asked them before. I, I, I have seen the wicked uh, uh, prosper. I, I, I lived through times when I experienced the silence of God. Times when I have uh, read his promises and did not see them come to fruition. I have prayed for close friends and few weeks later buried them. Uh, uh, Jesus said, ask anything in my name and you will receive it. I had asked, I have asked, I have believed, I, I have wept and, and, and begged. But at times to no avail, or at least that's what it seemed like. Jeremiah is asking God about those things. Your word, Lord, said, if we pray for the sick, they will be healed. Yet I prayed and he died. Your word said, if we drink a deadly thing, it will not harm us. Yet, yet, yet so many people like myself are living their life with intolerances and allergies to, to, to things that every other human being eat, not to poison, right? Many Christians are living in fear, are living in fear because they are scared that if they take the vaccine, they will die. Or if they are scared that if they catch the virus, they will die. And make no mistake, people have died from the vaccine and people have died from the virus, right? If you are honest, if you have lived in this world for just a short time, you would have witnessed and experienced God's word not, God's word not being fulfilled at times. You, 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 you would have at times experienced a disconnect between the word of God and the reality of life. And that is the very thing Jeremiah is asking the Lord about. Now, don't misunderstand me. Jeremiah is not approaching God from a lack of faith perspective. Neither is he doubting God's ability or God's love. He is simply confused and is seeking answers. He, he begins his questioning uh, with, with, uh, with stating his belief in God's righteousness. He says, righteous are thou, O Lord. So he is not questioning God's righteousness. He is simply questioning God's ways. Why did you and how could you type of questions, right? So the verse from which our theme comes is embedded in a context relating to faith. Not faith regarding the existence of God, not faith regarding the nature of God, but faith regarding the dealings of God, faith regarding uh, uh, things that, that happen in our everyday life. It, it is... Uh, uh, embedded in a context of faith in regards to my job, faith in regards to my loved one, my finances, my health, my everyday things. It, it was examining these things in, in, in the life of the wicked that led Jeremiah to question the Lord. You with me? It relates to practical faith, faith that touches our everyday life. It relates to how God deals with things that are happening in our everyday life. Now, in answer to Jeremiah's question, God says, If thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how in the world canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling? Of Jordan. It is a beautiful text and an amazing answer that contains advice to our everyday life. Now, what is the footman? It is the situation you are facing now, the trouble you are going through now. Uh, what are the horses? It is a situation that is to come, the trouble or challenges you are going to face in the future. Now, in order to understand the message contained in the verse, you need to understand that for Jeremiah, the race with the horses 
was already on its way. He was going to face it sooner or later. You see, contextually, what moved Jer Jeremiah to complain to the Lord or what moved Jeremiah to despair was his discovery of the conspiracy of the men of Anoth. Anoth. In, in, in the last three verses of chapter 11, the chapter just before this one, God said, some men from Anathoth want to kill you, but I will protect you. Now, no doubt this affected Jeremiah. And the next thing, the very next thing we read is him complaining to the Lord and saying, drag my enemies away and butcher them like sheep, right? That's what he's praying. Who are his enemies? Obviously, the ones he just mentioned in the just the previous verse. So when he knew about the conspiracy against him, it discouraged him. It made him question God's ways of, of doing things, right? Here they are conspiring to kill me and you are blessing them. Or at least you are not doing what you promised to do in your covenant, right? In your covenant, you said those who do not obey you, they will be cursed. And when I look at their life, when I examine their finances, when I examine their health, when I examine their family, when I examine their, their belongings and whatever else, their career, whatever else that you're thinking of, in the life of your enemies. When I examine that, I see no curse at all, Lord. As a matter of fact, I see the opposite. I see blessings. I see prosperity. I see great things happening to them. So what in the world is going on, Lord? I need answers, right? That's what Jeremiah was going through. Now, in answer to his complaint, God tells him, listen, if running with the footmen got you tired, man, if, if the news about the men of Anathos got you discouraged and you are questioning my ways, what in the world are you going to do when you run with the horses? Now to Jeremiah, running with the horses was what God tells him in the very next verse, in verse 6, which is, For even thy brethren, your own brothers, your own family, and the house of thy father, even they have dealt treacherously with thee. Yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto thee. If enmity with the sons of Anathoth got you discouraged, how are you going to cope with your own brothers, the sons of your father, turning against you? Are you following me? The running with footmen is what you are dealing with now. The running with horses is what is coming upon you. It is a much harder task. It is a much harder situation to navigate through. Now, I want to first examine the passage from a practical everyday life experiences, such as work, relationships, and, and, and so forth. There are two ways to look at it or, or two ways to apply the text, two lessons that we can pull out of it in, in the context of our everyday life work, uh, 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 advancing in my work and, and career and, and whatever, all this stuff, right? The first group or the first lesson is how it applies to those who want to give up. The second application that I want to apply it in is how it applies to those who want to skip the race. Uh, it will get clearer as, as, I, as I get into it. The first group are the kind of people who want to give up. Oh Lord, it is too much for me. Oh Lord, I can't handle it. Oh Lord, take it away from you, uh, from me. To you, God is saying, listen, there is a time of trouble such as never before that is coming upon this world. I need you to understand that the battle around the corner is much harder than the battle you are facing today. If COVID-19 and its effects, if losing your loved one, if the diagnosis the doctor told you, or whatever it is that you're facing today, if that has weeded you, if that has made you question my ways, my commitment and my love for you, then what in the world are you going to do when you see what is looming around the corner for you? You with me? And make no mistake, what is around the corner is harder, is tougher, is on a different level than what you are facing today, and it is coming. It is a message of warning and, and, and rebuke to those of us who are questioning God's ways as a result of the difficulty, the little difficulty we are facing today. Small difficulty in comparison to what is to come. In the rest of the chapter, God tells Jeremiah and us today that he will deal with Jeremiah's enemies, meaning he will fulfill his word. Those 
who are wicked will be cursed. He will fulfill his word. Whatever promise you have been eyeing in the word of God and you cannot see the fulfillment of it in your life or whatever it is, God is telling you through this chapter, don't worry, it will come. What is appearing, <clears throat> what is appearing as a disconnect between his promise and our life is only a moment of pause but the reality will eventually align itself with the word of god with the promises of god if not now in the future if not in this life in the life to come but it will be fulfilled god is saying my word will not return unto me void it will establish what it says the question I have for you, God is saying, the question I have for you is, are you going to trust me through the process of its alignment? Are you going to trust me during the time of the disconnect? This, this is one of the messages God is bringing to you and me today through this text. Are we going to trust him when things don't make sense? When the word says something and the reality says something else, God is saying, don't worry. Your enemies, they will answer for it. Don't worry about them. My question is for you. What are you going to do in this moment of pause? Me pausing my actions. Me pausing, fulfilling my word. I have paused it for now. What are you going to do? Are you going to trust me through it? Or what? That's the first message. Now, uh, so, so, so the question I guess that we, 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 we get from it is how is your faith during the time of the disappointment you're going through? As you look at the word of God, the promises of God and compare them to the reality of your life, many times we see a disconnect between what is written and what we experience. I have been through that, right? The question God is bringing to you in light of his promise that he will bring his word to fruition. That's what he promised in that chapter. He will bring it to fruition. The enemies will be destroyed, right? His promises will, will be fulfilled regardless of the waiting time. His question to you right now is, how is your faith doing? How are you coping with the waiting time? How are you coping with the disconnect? Are you discouraged? That's okay. The prophets of old got discouraged. Are you confused? That's okay. The prophets of old got confused as well, and it did not make sense to them either. Do you have questions? That's okay. They, the prophets of old, did have questions as well. They asked, and I answered them, God is saying. So bring your questions to me. Let me reason with you. Use this time of disconnect to disconnect from the world and connect with me. Look, <clears throat> look at those who asked the same questions you have. I answered. They held on and they obtained a good report through faith. So hold on, reason with me, ask and you shall be answered. And if things don't make sense, do, do, do not despair. Hold on. The reality you see with your eyes and handle with your hand is not the reality of the life I have for you. It will come. Just hold on. So this is the first message, practical message that we get from this, uh, this passage. Now, the second application that I mentioned is, is the people who want to skip the race, right? You, you have people who want to skip the race with the footman and enter the horse's race yet they are not keeping up with the footman they are not willing to train with the footman what i mean by that we have people that that think that the grass is greener on the other side we want what others have we see a brother or a sister with a particular gift and and we desire it we aspire for it right we dream of what we can be and we so desperately want it that we neglect who we are now and what we have now let me illustrate it for you when god called me into his work i couldn't preach 
I, I couldn't speak in public. All what I could do was type on the computer. Now, I'll be lying to you if I say I did not want to be a preacher. I did not desire to speak uh, in front of a crowd and, and, and share what's on my heart, right? Uh, I'll be lying if I said I didn't. I did, but I couldn't. I tried, but, but I would sweat so much from being uh, so nervous. I would forget half what I want to say, and I end up saying the wrong thing, right? I, I just wasn't ready for it. So what I did was I focused on what I could do. I spent my time replying to emails and typing books and so forth. I did it to the best of my ability. Now, I could have done what I know others did, which is spend all my effort forcing myself to be a preacher, make a mess of it and a mess of myself, and at the same time end up ignoring the gift that I had, the race that I had. I could have neglected the ministry God gave me now by getting so busy trying to get to what is around the corner. Are you following me? We have people neglecting where they are now because they are too busy trying to reach after and obtain where they are going tomorrow. Oh, they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend my time doing this when God promised me that. I know what God called me for. I know what God has in store for me, and it is not this. So I'm not going to spend my time focusing on this, right? Well, guess what? You're not going to receive that unless you excel in this. You know why? Because Jesus said, if you are faithful over a few things, you will be made ruler over many things. The running with footmen is preparing you to run with horses. And until you master running with footmen, there is no use for you signing up in the horse's race. Are you following what I'm saying? We aspire greatness. We want greatness. We ask God for greatness while we, are strugg while we struggle to handle the smallness that God has given us. Why would you ask God for greatness in your career or greatness in your ministry or greatness in whatever you're pursuing if you are not managing the smallness God has already blessed you with? Your race with the footman is what you are. Your race with the horses is what you shall be. You need to focus on what you are and master it in order to become what you shall be. We need God's help to excel in the footman's race. We need to master the footman's race, to master the small things we have in our hands first. Why? Because it is the footman's race that is preparing me and you for the horse's race. And make no mistake, the horse's race is just around the corner. It is coming. You see, the problem is that many people don't understand the importance of the footman's race. It is the foundation. It is the training for the big event. And you have people signing up for the big event, showing up on the day of the race without putting any effort in the training. Guess what? you will not be able to keep up with the horses. Why? Because you missed on the training. You missed on the process of getting there. Your time will come. Maybe it is now. Maybe your time is now to run with the horses. I don't know your individual life. All what I'm saying is make no mistake unless you excel in running with the footmen. You are not going to keep up with the horses. So wherever you are, whatever your challenge uh, 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 you're facing today is, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Focus on where you are, conquer where you are, and you will get to where you are meant to be. Give attention to the responsibility you have now, and that will enable you to get to where you are meant to be. <clears throat> the story goes about... Uh, this man who went into a, uh, uh, a cafe during the time of depression, he sat down and he ordered the coffee. Coffee. So, so the lady, the waitress, brings him uh, 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 the coffee, and, and the guy asks, "Hey, look, can I can I have some sugar, please?" Now it was the time of the depression, and and one of uh, one of the things that was hard to get hold of was sugar. So the waitress goes over and gets a jar, and she pulls out a little cube 
almost quarter the size of the usual one that people have, and she places it on his plate. Now the man looks at the plate, and then he looks at the woman. He looks at the plate, and he looks at the woman, and and he he gives her this 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 look of of shock and and disappointment. It's like uh, it's too small. What in the world do you want me to do with this sugar, right? And the waitress looks at the man and says, "Sir, stir what you've got. Stir what you've got. Don't worry about what you don't have or what you wish you had or what you know you will have in the future. Just stir what you got in your possession now." In Matthew 25, Jesus Jesus tells the parable of of uh, the parable of the talents, right? You have five talents, you have two talents, and you have one talent. And when he came back, he expected, uh, well, he received uh, 10 from the one who had five. He received four from the one who had two. And he would have expected two from the one who had one, as in one prophet, right? If God has given you one talent, then use this one talent for his glory. And do it now. If God has given you two talents, then use those two talents for his glory and do it now. Just use what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have or, or what you could have or what you know you will have in the future. Excel in what you have and God will give you what you don't have. If you are struggling in your position as a secretary, why in the world are you asking God to make you the CEO? You won't be able to handle that position. The reason God is not giving it to you is because you're not ready for it. And so long you are ignoring your current position, your current responsibility, and spending your time dreaming about a CEO, you will not get it. And if you force yourself into it, you will make a mess of it. <clears throat> when Moses was complaining to God being, about being the, the, the man who will lead uh, Israel out of Egypt uh, saying I can do it Lord I stutter Pharaoh won't receive me Pharaoh hates me and this and that God asked Moses he told him what is in your hand Moses what is that in your hand and Moses said it's a rod Lord he said okay throw it down you know the story the rod turned into a snake Moses ran away then through that rod uh, 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 God through the rod that Moses was holding divided the sea delivered Israel and and, and so forth you might not feel that you are the right man or woman for the job. You might think that you are not qualified enough, but God is not asking you what you think. God is asking you what is in your hand. So do what you can and do it now. If you are at the footman's race, focus on it and excel in it because it is preparing you for the horse's race. So the second message God wants you and me to get from this text is do not give up what you have now in order to get to where you are meant to be if you haven't mastered it yet. I'm talking about everything practical life. I'm talking about your job. I'm talking about your study. I'm talking about your relationship. You know, don't, don't, don't give up on your partner because, ah, oh, he's this and he's that, thinking that you have a better partner. Look, man, if you can't make it work with this one, what makes you think you're going to make it with the other one? Right? Use what is in your hand to prepare you for what is coming. Maybe the reason there is a, a disconnect between what God promised you and what you have now is the fact that you are not ready for the promise yet. Maybe it's because uh, 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 you have been missing out on the training that will get you ready for the promise. So focus on the task at hand. Ask God to make you a master in the footman's race so you can be ready for the horse's race. You with me? Now, moving to, to, to our theme, uh, contending with horses. Now, contextually contending with horses is the next level test. The way I see it it, it, it is a call to become who we shall be. It is a call to live out, to manifest now who we shall be. When it comes to our spiritual walk, the real purpose of the test is not the test itself. Trials and difficulties are avenues God uses to build our faith and to reveal to us, to me, 
where I am, where we are on the faith spectrum and to grow spiritually from it, right? You see, both running with footmen and running with horses, they both are races. They both are of the same nature. It is just that they are on a different dimension or on a different level. The race with the footmen is an analogy God used to speak to Jeremiah about the level of difficulty he is going through now. And as I said earlier, the aim of the difficulty is to grow in faith. In other words, the race with footmen and the race with horses are analogies used describing the level of faith a person has. The stronger your faith, the more you can handle. So contending with horses describes your strength in faith, right? Now, another aspect to it is that racing with footmen is natural. It's something most people uh, uh, could handle, right? We all, once, well, most of us once upon a time got involved in, in a race with a friend, with whatever it is, right? It's something we can handle. It's something natural. But racing with horses is something supernatural. You never hear of any man that is faster than a horse. So the theme of these meetings talk about a David <clears throat> talk about a David versus Goliath situation. The, the, the way a horse runs is like a Goliath in comparison to the way I run. So, so contending with horses, it speaks of circumstances or a difficulty that is much larger than you can handle. Not only that, um, but just like in the situation of David and Goliath, God made promises to Israel. And, and, and at the day of Goliath, between Israel and the fulfillment of those promises, right? Between them today and is waiting for them tomorrow stands a Goliath. Are you with me? Contending with horses describes your battle with what is standing between your now and your tomorrow <clears throat> spiritually, between who you are now and who you shall be tomorrow spiritually. It is, it, it is the battle that stands between what you read in your Bible and the reality of your expectation in your everyday day life. If if we know what was the key that led David to kill Goliath, I think we will know how to run with horses. We will get a key in there, right? Both of them, David killing Goliath or running with horses, both are impossible situations and both are standing between your now and your tomorrow. The, the, the disconnect is found there. It's between the, 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 what the Word of God says, what His promises tell us, and the reality, right? Now, a very important hint about how David killed Goliath is found in the way David saw Goliath. Notice what David said. <clears throat> and David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel. <clears throat> For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see, David viewed his Goliath as an uncircumcised Philistine, meaning while all Israel were looking at the size of the giant and consumed by it, David looked elsewhere. The word circumcised was synonymous with an Israelite under God's covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham and it flowed down to Israel. He instructed them to circumcise their children. If a Gentile wanted to become part of Israel, he was to be circumcised and so forth. Meaning circumcision was a sign of entering into God's covenant. So back to David and Goliath. David's perspective of the situation was different. The Israelites saw a giant versus an ordinary person. David saw an uncircumcised man versus the armies of the living God. <clears throat> the Israelites were obsessed by the seen and by the physical reality. While David saw beyond the physical, he began his perspective in the unseen spiritual reality. 
the real issue in here was not a tall man versus a short man. No, the real issue was Satan versus God. A man outside the covenant with God versus a man in covenant with God. That is the real issue. And David, as a man in covenant with God, is one of uh, <clears throat> is one of the people who is on God's side. And he believed because he is on God's side that he will crush all the enemies of God because God is on his side. He is on God's side, regardless how tall or short he is. The height is irrelevant. The size of the problem is irrelevant. The size of Goliath is irrelevant. What is relevant is the perspective. The lesson we learn from this story is behind every physical seen Goliath is a spiritual unseen reality. <clears throat> The battle does not begin in the physical. It begins in the spiritual. And to conquer the horses, to win in your race with the horses, you, me, we need to take our eyes off the physical and look at the spiritual. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is why it is important to go through the footman's race, because through that race, we see God's hand in the little things that we can handle, which will prepare us to trust God's hand in the big things that we cannot handle. If you focus on the seen <clears throat> and physical reality, you will despair. You will get discouraged because physically it is impossible to run with horses physically it's an impossible task how in the world do you outrun a horse right how in the world can a short man kill a, a giant but if we learn to look beyond the seen and physical into the unseen spiritual reality we will uh, 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 we will be ready to race horses we will be set we will be equipped to race horses now <clears throat> I, I want to tie all these points together. As I mentioned earlier, whether you are racing with footmen or racing with horses, they both are of the same nature. They're just different dimension or a different level. If you learn to conquer in the footman's race, you will conquer in the horse's race. Whatever size your Goliath is, the way to victory is the same. And John spells it to us. <clears throat> spells it out to us very clearly. He says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God, <clears throat> excuse me, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's not, it's not the size of the stone that you hold. It's not the size of the sling. It's not the size of your muscles. Muscles. It's not the type and the make of the, the sneakers, your running shoes that you're going to put on to run with horses. That is not what is going to gain you the victory, man. It is your faith. You are entering into a supernatural race, a supernatural competition. It doesn't matter what size your foot is. It doesn't matter how big your legs are. It doesn't matter what type of sneakers you wear. You're not going to keep up with the horse. It is a supernatural race. You with me? You need to enter it through a faith perspective. What you will learn in the footman's race is what you will use in the horse's race. And it is this, faith is your victory. <clears throat> now, what is faith? Faith is, is, a, is a perspective. You see, when, when, when you learn to look at things through the eyes of faith, you will start seeing things from a different perspective. David did not see Goliath in the same way everyone else did. And because he saw his Goliath from a different perspective, it changed the nature of the battle. You with me? Because he saw Goliath from a different perspective, from a faith perspective, it just changed the nature of battle. He didn't run at Goliath saying, I come to you with all the muscles and, and the skills I, I acquired by killing the lion and the bear. No, he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. The, 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 the nature of the battle changed. It's no longer in the physical. It is in the spiritual now. 
David was not looking at what everyone else was seeing. David was looking at things from a covenantal perspective, which meant Goliath did not have a covering. Well, I have a covering. Goliath does not have God's protection. Well, I have God's protection. So I have divine authority and my Goliath does not. Are you with me? This is the perspective you learn through the footman's race, which enables you to conquer in the horse's race. Make no mistake, running with horses is a mammoth of a Goliath. It speaks of a problem much larger than you, much stronger than you. And, and, if, you, uh, uh, and if you will see it from your normal human perspective, you will do what all Israel did. You will cave in, you will run away, you will give up, and you will never see the fruition of God's promise because of the Goliath in your way. When you change how you see what you see, you will change what you do with what you see. When you change how you see what you see, you will change what you do with what you see. You with me? Because of Israel's perspective on the situation, they ran away. They ran from Goliath. They spent their time on the defense. They did not go on the offense. And that is what many Christians do when they face their Goliath. They spend their life on the defensive side. They, 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 they do not conquer their Goliath. They simply learn how to patch up the damage he does. Why? Because they have a wrong perspective on the problem they are facing. But David, on the other hand, when, when the lion and bear attacked his sheep, he, he, he ran at them. When he came face to face with Goliath, he ran at him. When you see things from a covenantal perspective, from a faith perspective, you shift, you shift from being on the defensive to being on the offensive. And when I understood that, I understood what Jesus meant in Matthew 16, verse 18, when he said, And I say also unto you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, the rock that he just said before that I'm the son of God, right? Upon this foundation, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell are not the gates of the church, even though sometimes they appear to be in some particular denominations and abominations. You with me? But that particular church that Jesus was talking about is his pure, true church. And the gates of hell are not the gates of the church. The gates of hell are, are in the enemy's territory. I mean, that's simple. Meaning, when God's church is built upon Christ, the Son of God, it will not be on the defensive. It will be on the offensive. It will crush the gates of hell. It will be on the attack. It will enter the, uh, the territory of the enemy and it will crush the gate of the enemy, his stronghold. The enemy will be destroyed. <clears throat> until we start seeing things through the eyes of faith, until we begin to see things from a, a different perspective, from God's perspective, we will not kill our Goliath. We will not trace with the horses we will not crush the gates of hell and we will not bridge the disconnect between god's promise and the reality of our life <clears throat> so my dear brother and my dear sister now is the time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed to contend with horses is to walk by faith, not just simply talk about faith. Is to walk in the spirit, not just simply talk about the spirit. Racing with horses is supernatural. And God doesn't want us to just join the race. He wants us to win in the race. He wants us to conquer. Now, there's only one way to win a supernatural battle. There is only one way to kill your Goliath to race with horses, and that is 
for God to move for God to act on your behalf make no mistake it is a race we can not win it is a race that only God can win so God has to act don't go signing up for it if God is not with you you're gonna lose you got to make sure God is with you. God is leading you there. You got to make sure you learned from the first race. You conquered in the first race. You grew from the first race. And hence you're ready for the second race. Now, we need God to act. But as we look in the Bible, God acted after men acted. Moses held the rod before the waters were parted. The priest stepped into the river before the water parted peter threw the net on the other side before the fish went into the net people had to move the stone before jesus raised lazarus what i mean is that we need to walk by faith walk in the spirit in order to kill our goliath to win the race with horses don't just sit on your behind and do nothing man learn what the walk of faith is learn what it means to walk in the spirit and start acting upon it and watch how god will act and will do what we cannot do just dip your toes in that water man stop being scared from it start your march and see how god will part the water and the first step to walking by faith is recognizing who we are simple had David not recognized himself as one who is under God's covenant, he would not have dared to meet Goliath. To race with horses, whatever shape or form that takes in your life, you need to come to grips with who you are in Christ. You need to accept the reality that you are a child of God under the covenant made with god through christ jesus you are one who is protected by god who has been given authority over all the goliaths in this world that is you that is your reality this is one of the abc's one of the basic things we ought to believe as we embark on our walk by faith or our walk in the spirit however there is a a deeper and more foundational fact we ought to be confident of as we journey with God. We need to grasp hold of God's character, of God's faithfulness and love for me. You see, Jeremiah's question echo the questions of many Christians in this world. Many have asked the same questions. Lord, why don't I see your word fulfilled in this world? Why am I not blessed even though I'm obedient. Why are you not delivering me from the Goliath in my life? Why is there a disconnect between your promise and my reality? I'm not saying this is the case all the time. I'm not saying this is the case of every Christian. I'm not saying every Christian asks this. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is there are many Christians that ask these questions, that think these questions, that might be too afraid to verbalize these questions. Well, I'm verbalizing them for you because I am in the same boat that you are in. And I've experienced times when I pray and I ask and I claim promises and it just doesn't happen. I had to close the casket on my friend. You with me? Now, every prophet who asked this question received an answer. And the answer has always been the same. To Job, God said, can you run things better than I can run, man? Like, honestly. Can you, can you do things better than I can? Can you be more faithful to my people than I can? If not, then zip it. To David, God said, look to the sanctuary and see the end of the wicked. They will perish. My word will be fulfilled, if not now, in the future. To Jeremiah, God told him in the very chapter we are considering that the wicked will be destroyed, meaning my word will be fulfilled. But to all of them, the answer came with a challenge to their faith, to their trust. In Job's case, the challenge was, you, you don't understand what I understand. You don't know what I know. Are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust me, Job? I don't need to explain things to you. I don't need to get your permission. I don't need to make you omniscient and all-knowing so you can understand my plan. The question is, are you going to trust me even though you don't understand? That was a challenge. In Jeremiah's case, the challenge was, how in the world are you going to keep up with the horses race? 
with what's coming ahead of you. Now, I want to bring this challenge to you and to me today. And out of it, bring a lesson regarding faith, our faith. The reality is, I, like you, have experienced times when God's word has not come to pass in my life. Just like I just said, when, 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 I, when I see others more blessed than I am, others that in my self-righteousness deem to be less godly than I am, yet they are more blessed than I am. I'm saying that's in my self-righteousness, right? I'm not saying that's the way when you're living in God's righteousness, you should be, right? Um, and at times, many times, when, when, when this happens, when, when we pray, believe, and have faith, but our Goliath does not go away, we start doubting. We, 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 we start questioning our faith, our walk with God, and uh, we question our walk with God, and, 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 and we question God's dealings, we, we, just like Jeremiah did. Jeremiah questioned God's dealing. I mean, why would you behave this way, Lord? Now, in, in, in light of this, I want to point your attention to an indirect message found in Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter about faith. I, I, I want to point you to this indirect message because I believe it speaks to the situation where I look at my brother and I see the Goliath in his life has been conquered. Yet I look at my Goliath and I see him staring me in the eye and not going anywhere. Right? He, he, I hope you know what I mean. I, everyone has a Goliath. Everyone has a challenge. Everyone has a difficulty. Everyone has something he's asking. He, he wants victory over it. He, he wants it to go away. Just leave me alone, man. Everyone has a demon to deal with. I'm talking about that demon. When you see that your friend is delivered from that demon, but you're not. I, I, I want to talk to you. That's who I'm talking to, right? If, if you've never faced that, if God answered every prayer in your life from the day you were, you knew what prayer is till now, you've never had an answer prayer, well, you know, just sit there and act as a bad example. But I'm speaking to the rest of you. You see, the last thought in, in, in chapter 10 tells the reader, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Straight after, he, he just told the reader that just will live by faith. All right, writer, whoever the author is, Paul or whoever, what, in, what, what is faith? So he defines what faith is. You know, verses 1 to 3, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things unseen and so forth. You know it very well. After he defi he tells you that just will live by faith. Now here is what faith is. And then after that, he lists some of the heroes of faith to tell the reader how faith looks like in action and in the order of the list is found a very important message that many readers miss let me briefly sum up the point for you in their orders right in the order <clears throat> notice what he first talks about he says by faith i'm not gonna see every time by faith but, but he says by faith abel died enoch never died then he talks about noah Noah stayed in one place all his life building an ark. Abraham went out in search for a place. He spent his life traveling. Sarah received a child, Isaac. Abraham offered up that very same child, Isaac. Then he says, Isaac ignorantly blessed the younger more than the elder. Then straight after him, he talks about Jacob knowingly blessed the younger more than the elder. Then he talks about Joseph. Joseph entered Egypt, became rich, and died hoping to exit Egypt. Moses left Egypt, became poor, and lived Joseph's dream. Then he says, the walls of Jericho fell. Then straight after he says, well, Rahab's wall in Jericho didn't fall. Then he says, believers escaped the edge of the sword. Then after he says, believers were slain with the sword. I, I, are you catching what the author is saying without saying? All these people by faith obtained a good report. And all these people, because of the, their faith, what is listed there happened to them. The message in this list is that what happens to you is not a good or a clear evidence of your faith. 
just because your Goliath is not dying now while your brothers is does not mean you don't have faith it does not mean God is not on your side it does not mean God is not hearing your prayer and answering them running with horses demands a level of faith that ignores a level of faith that ignores the seen and the physical and focuses on or operates on the unseen and spiritual it demands a faith that builds its hope its reality its confidence and assurance on god's character on god's faithfulness and love not on mine you see when life does not uh, uh make sense to you when 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 god's dealings do not make sense to us when when times uh, 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 are tough we we doubt we get discouraged our love for god at times uh, uh, gets affected our, our faith wavers and if my confidence is built on the strength of my faith my loyalty and my love to god then i will falter but when my confidence and assurance is built on god's faithfulness to his promises not mine on god's love for me not mine on god's character not mine then when things get tough when my goliath seems to be staring me in the eye and nothing is shaking him when life isn't making sense like what happened to jeremiah I will not question God's dealings because I know in whom I have believed. Even though the outcome of faith in the lives of those heroes was not the same, even though in, in, in some cases Goliath seemed to kill a believer, that is not the reality. There is only their physical reality. There is only the seen reality. But behind the scene, in the unseen and spiritual reality, that is not the reality. By faith, they obtained the good report. By faith, they held on to the unseen spiritual reality, even though in the seen physical reality, Goliath won and they were slain by the sword. In the real reality, which is the unseen spiritual reality, they won. For there is a crown of life waiting for them contending with horses is a stage in our spiritual walk when the physical seeing reality no longer affects our hold and confidence sorry no longer affects us but our hold and uh, affects our hold and confidence let me say that again i wrote it wrong contending with horses is a stage in our spiritual walk when the physical and seen reality is no longer affected by the physical right our our confidence our strength is in the unseen spiritual reality that's a level of faith that we need to contend with horses where the the physical and the seen does not affect my faith because my confidence and my faith is built on the unseen and spiritual reality <clears throat> it is it is a stage when regardless how fast the enemy can run i will not be discouraged why because my hope my faith my confidence and assurance is not built on what i see with my physical eye rather it is built on the word of god so my question for you and me today is are you ready to run with horses are you ready to see through the eyes of faith? Is your life governed by your physical, tangible five senses that you have? Or is your life governed by your, the Spirit of God, which is in harmony with your spirit, or your spirit is in harmony with Him? Are you governed by the spiritual, right? That's, that's a question that we need to ask for ourselves. We need, we need to uh, see God at whatever level of the race we are in. We need to see God to help us to excel, to learn that lesson, to enter that sphere of race in order to contend with what is coming our way 
in the future. Amen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient with me. Uh, allow me to close with a prayer.